Welcome to the Managing Draft Beverage Quality and Eliminating Waste webinar. This webinar is being hosted by the National Pollution Prevention Roundtable Food and Beverage Workgroup and the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Sustainable Craft Beverage Program. I'm Kathy Black. I'm the Pollution Prevention Coordinator for the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, and I'm joined by co-host Ben Jarvis, and he is uh, waving to you. <laughs> he's from um, the Pollution Prevention, uh, I'm sorry, he's the Pollution Prevention Projects Coordinator from the Idaho Department of, De uh, Department of Environmental Quality. And uh, we also have Erin Waters here. She's the Pollution Prevention Specialist uh, from DES, and she is admitting more people from the lobby. So I am very grateful for her uh, for taking care of these uh, housekeeping things for us. Um, I'd like to let everyone know, first of all, that this webinar is being recorded and that um, we do have attendees muted right now, um, but we will have a question and answer portion at the end of the webinar um, where we will unmute people. Also, if you have questions, go ahead and use the chat box. I went ahead and put in some resources for folks there. Um, including uh, links to the Bar Track website, the National Pollution Prevention Roundtable website, and uh, the Sustainable Craft Beverage Program website. So I'm just gonna give you a little background on the New Hampshire Sustainable Craft Beverage Program. We offer pre, uh, free technical assistance to craft beverage producers to help them become more sustainable. Specifically, we offer assistance with energy efficiency, water conservation, chemical substitution, you know, less toxic cleaners, that sort of thing, and waste uh, reduction project uh, projects that might include wastewater, solid waste. And I would like to acknowledge that our work and this webinar is being made possible through funds, um, a grant that we were grant, uh, provided by the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Now I'd like to ask Ben Jarvis to just give us a little background on the National Pollution Prevention Roundtable. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Kathy? Second. Yes, Ben. Oh, now you're muted. How about now? Yes. All right, cool. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I just want to take this time to um, explain for folks who might not already be members of the National Pollution Prevention Roundtable. NPPR exists um, as a forum to promote the development, implementation, and evaluation of efforts to avoid, eliminate, or reduce waste generated to air, land, and water. That is the organization's mission statement, and it's made up of um, primarily of volunteers, um, who work together to convene um, events like the webinar you're participating in today. So um, if you're not already a member, we strongly encourage you to um, consider joining the NPPR because we want to continue to be able to make um, forums and events like this happen. And we want more ideas from people. We want more participation. Um, we want more interest and in energy being driven into pollution prevention. So um, I'll post into the chat um, uh, just a link to um, the uh, the join us page with all of the different uh, membership levels um, that are on there. So uh, strongly encourage you to participate. We really want more people to be uh, involved in this and really excited to see so many of you on today. So um, thank you all for participating. Ha, I muted this time. <laughs> So sorry. Uh, thanks a lot, Ben. That was a great introduction um, to the Pollution Prevention Roundtable. It really is a great group of individuals. Um, it's not only uh, e EPA P2 grantees, there's consultants, there's people from universities, there's students. So there's a lot of energy and, um, you know, I hope that if you're not a member that you will consider joining. Um, but now for the star of the show, I'd like to introduce to you today's speaker, Ian Purcell. Ian is the Senior Director of Client Success at BarTrek. He's also um, he's also the co-founder and VP of Business, business Development at Malarkey uh, Spirits, uh, Distill Spirits. Um, Ian uh, began his 23-year service 
uh, career humbly as checking IDs and washing dishes at the Blue Iguana Bar and Restaurant. Um, I'm very familiar with serving my duty in those uh, those uh, ways as well. Um, he eventually uh, rose through the ranks as a server, bartender, restaurateur, owning and operating several restaurants in Northern Virginia. He went on to found one of Virginia's top rated distilleries. He's consulted for 30 plus businesses throughout his hospitality. Um, I'm sorry, through his hospitality consulting firm. 703 Consulting, and eventually helped lay the groundwork for the hospitality technology company BarTrack. So Ian specializes in providing clients with insights, inspiration, and tools to help them grow and thrive in their business by taking an open, people-first approach to systems, standards, and leadership. With a focus on positive workplace accountability and communication, Developing and implementing best practices and maximizing draft beverage profits, which I think is the reason there's a lot of people here today for this webinar. So I will let Ian take it from here. Thank you so much, Ian. Catherine, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. And I'm very excited to be here um, on the client success side. We tend to do webinars that are more focused on businesses ROI and, and how they can put money back into the business. And I'm excited about this because one of the reasons we started this company um, was not just to make beer taste better, but uh, and so, um, I'm pretty stoked that we get to come in here and talk about this and be surrounded by people that are looking to make a difference uh, uh, in their areas and their local areas uh, and in the U.S. in general. So um, jumping into this, uh, like Catherine said, I oversee uh, Bartrack's uh, client success department. My focus in our department here is um, helping businesses implement our product uh, into their day to day operations in a way that doesn't throw a wrench in the gears. Um, and like I said, a big focal point of why people are bringing our products in is because they want to try to put money back into the business. They want to eliminate waste and, uh, without even really realizing that this is, uh, that part of that process um, of eliminating waste is something that can be, uh, extremely environmental friendly. And I think in addition to that, um, it's something that can be, um, marketed and, and showcased to your to your customer base, people are a lot more attentive um, to uh, to what's going on around them. And as we started this process and as we move through the slides here, uh, as we started this process, we started to recognize the amount of loss um, that was occurring um, more so on the brewery side because there's a lot more margins there. There's a lot more um, there's a lot less uh, attentiveness to to what's going on, whereas in the restaurant world, um, we're seeing that they're paying a little bit more attention because they're paying more for the product. And I think Catherine, you're controlling the slides here. If you want to move to the to the next one, um, you know, there's a lot of waste that occurs uh, yearly in the U.S. Uh, over 900 million gallons of beer um, uh, lost yearly. And uh, for those of you who don't know, beer is is majority water. Uh, we see in the production um, of of creating beer and the production side of things on the facility sides five plus billion gallons of water um, is lost each year, which is a considerable amount. This is in addition to uh, 25 plus million pounds of hops, um, plus another billion dollars of other ingredients of grains, yeast, and et cetera. Um, on the bar track side, we're kind of on the back end of that production side. Uh, we wanna make sure that you're putting all of this effort into creating this great product uh, we want to make sure that uh, not only does it come out the way the brewer intended, but that you're um, maximizing your profits, meaning you are getting the most out of each keg. And we see that a lot of this loss is coming from not just on the production side, but on the distribution side and then on the sell of that product or the actual pouring of that product. Um, we've also now started the process of integrating with other companies like Beer 30 who work on the back end um, to make sure that you are maximizing your uh your grains, your yeast, getting the most out of those. And so really kind of coming in with this grain to glass concept of how can we um, uh, save this product or utilize it to the best of our ability. And that kind of leads into bar track, which on the next slide here, uh, 
where this loss is coming from. There's there's the numbers are a little skewed here in the sense that what we're looking at is that uh, the average restaurant actually loses about 22.5 percent. It, it give or takes in either direction between 75 to 80 percent of loss um, uh, it, for restaurants in the United States. Um, and we see that loss coming from unbalanced draft systems, overpouring, unaccounted drinks, so on and so forth. In the brewery world, um, we see that that's actually a, a larger number. That loss is between 30 to 40 percent. Uh, I would say, I think when we did our, our study on it last, it was about 83 to 85% of our brewery customers when they start with us um, are about 60% efficient. They're between 60 to 65% efficient, meaning 60 to 65% of the pours they make have sales associated with them. That other 35 to 40% do not. Um, and in traditional inventories where you are picking up a keg, weighing that or doing the old shake and bake this is a 0.5 this is a 0.6 um you're really just left with here's how much product we brought in here's how much product we sold and here's how much product went away right and so um with that being said uh bar track our focal point was um we don't just want to give you a variance a lump sum because when you have a lump sum when you're saying hey you guys are missing two kegs this week or this month a lot of times owners just kind of point that finger over at their staff and say, hey, guys, we have to do better. Uh, you know, make sure you're ringing these drinks up, whatever the case may be, without really understanding where that loss comes from. Right. And so our goal in bar track was to be able to segment that waste and to be able to show you um, where the waste is occurring, the who, what, when, where and why. But not only that, to be able to start to dial in and actually address quality problems on on um, on your draft lines. Uh, so moving forward here, um, if you want to click next one there, Catherine, uh, we created, it's really a three part system here, right? We wanted to get away from turbine flow meters. Um, we wanted to get away from traditional inventory. Traditional inventory doesn't really give you true realistic numbers. You're really basing it off of theoreticals. And even as you go into the turbine flow meter side of things, it's still theoreticals, but you're also plugging units onto your draft lines that are actually creating more waste. Think of a, sp a fan spinning around as it's hitting that beer, it's degassing that CO2 breakout, um, and it's causing loss when it occurs. Uh, we took the better part of four and a half years to develop a non-intrusive sensor it has no moving parts. Nothing is touching that product um, as it moves through. Um, and what we really spent the time on was being able to do, develop a sensor that can differentiate between CO2, air, if you want to call it that, uh, liquid, and foam. Um, in addition to that, um, our sensor is monitoring about a dozen different beer-specific variables. So we're monitoring the temperature of your keg room. We're monitoring the humidity of your keg room if you're storing food in there. We're monitoring uh, temperature of the keg itself. We're monitoring high pressures, your, your flow rates. We're monitoring low pressures, which are also your flow rates, as well as uh, CO2 breakout or degassing, air bubbles, air pockets, slugs of air, foaming, whatever you want to call it. And the way that our system works is every pour is monitored um, and it starts with the hardware, right? And as that beer flows through that, that, that hardware, it's monitoring those pours and uh, that hardware speaks to the software, which is our app. And within our app, uh, you get all kinds of neat stuff like real-time inventory and, and keg levels and things of that nature. But um, the stuff that I kind of geek out on is the ability to look in and actually see the temperature of your lines and your kegs, the ability to see what pressures you're pouring in high or low. And so if a, if a line's foaming up on you and you're pouring that beer and it's foaming up, Traditionally, people go in the back and they're twisting this dial and this PSI and doing this and doing that. But with bar track, we give you the ability to look in your phone app um, or on a tablet. And if that beer is foaming, look in. Maybe that keg just came in hot from the distributor and it's pouring at 60, 70 degrees, right? You can see that. You can identify it. You can switch that keg out, put another one on. Um, if you're pouring in high pressure or low pressure, you'll be able to see that in the app. You can actually use the app to walk your pressures back up or walk them back down to where you start pouring beer clean again. And the purpose of this is, is that, listen, I, I was a bartender for too many years and then became the bartender of, or became the owner of the bar, the bar I bartended at. And, and um, I was the problem. Um, we were constantly trying to diagnose issues on our draft system without even really knowing what we were doing. We would pour kegs, foam going down the drain, not even realizing that the keg was hot 
twisting this dial, twisting that dial. We have, uh, with our app, we have hostesses at restaurants that are able to go in the back there and actually tweak uh, the PSI to get their beer pouring clean. It simplifies the process so that um, individuals have the ability to go in and now start to address issues when they're occurring, um, as opposed to waiting to an inventory a week later or two weeks later, or in some cases a month later, just to know that you have loss and not be able to identify those issues. And between the software and the hardware, we create efficiency reports. And this is really where my team's department comes in. Um, it's the numbers, it's the data analytics, it's the stuff that we like to geek out on. But what's important about our reports um, is that you're getting daily, weekly, and monthly data uh, where we are segmenting your waste. We're not just coming in and saying, here's how much product you sold and here's how much went to waste. We are actually pinpointing specific categories of where your loss is occurring. And in addition to that, we're breaking that into hourly reports so you can start to identify what time that's happening and also if it's specific individuals that are causing those issues. And so, yes, you're going to be able to see if Catherine didn't ring up 15 Bud Lights on the day that she was working and we timestamp that and that's one aspect of it. But where I think it really applies to the conversation here is we're able to pinpoint uh, on a per beverage basis over pours uh, due to either incorrect glassware due to um, uh, courtesy pours, which we see a lot opening the tap handle, letting the beer run out for a few seconds and then um, um, putting your glass underneath that. And it doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're dealing with uh, a customer of ours like stadiums or large breweries, we have one customer, uh, one brewery customer that was losing over $80,000 a month just in overpours because they were using incorrect glassware. And within one week, we were able to pinpoint that, identify that, get new glassware, and we were able to drink, drop that $80,000 um, down to less than $5,000 a month. Now, the numbers there and the dollar amounts are what people pay attention to, but the amount of beer and waste that was occurring at that one location was astronomical. Um, and that's what we get excited about. Um, identifying foaming issues on your draft lines, not just saying, hey, you have a problem here, but being able to pinpoint, is this foaming issue happening in your keg room? Is it happening somewhere in your long draw? What type of issue it most likely is so that either you can address it or you can call a draft tech to come out and, and address it. And what we see is that a lot of the loss that's occurring on draft lines is not because you have a bad apple or someone giving away free beers. It's really due to uh, unbalanced draft lines and um, and being able to, to break that down into a science it's easy for people to, to understand and be able to make adjustments um, is really a big part of what we do and then other factors comps but another thing that we see is is um, is keg changes and line cleanings there is waste that occurs during that process and being able to segment that and put it into its own category one so that your bartenders and staff aren't getting blamed for things that are out of their control but two if you're having issues during keg changes why is it taking you so long to bleed that line Getting in there and making adjustments on that, understanding that when you're cleaning your lines, what it, how much beer is going into waste there and being able to time these cleanings in a manner so that you can do it after a keg is kicked or when a keg is about to kick and there's less uh, uh, beer left in those lines. Um, and so that's really the kind of the concept behind the product itself. Um, moving forward here, Catherine, you want to show you guys a little bit of what the uh, sensors look like. These are plug and play. Um, we're actually pretty stoked because we're moving away uh, now from our metal casings and going into a recyclable plastic. That's going to be really neat for us. So we're pumped about that. Um, each one of these is this is four lines. Um, and if you move to the next slide, Catherine, you can see what it looks like installed here. These sit flush against the wall. Um, they're a plug and play system. They last a lifetime. You, there is no maintenance on these. There is no uh, cleaning of the sensors. They get cleaned every time. As long as you're cleaning your lines, at least they get cleaned every single time. Um, and um, once they're in, they kind of just rock and roll uh, on their own. And moving forward here, um, and if I'm going too quick, fast, let me know if you guys want to take pictures. One of the things that I think is really cool about BarTrack is we don't just go in and plug our product in there. Um, again, coming back to the fact that this company um, was started because we wanted to make beer taste better and we wanted to prevent and eliminate waste as much as possible. And so when we install our product, we don't just install it. We actually come in and um, have Micromatic certified installers that, that balance out those draft lines. And so we start right out the gate of addressing the problems on your lines, pinpointing unbalanced lines, 
dialing them in using our sensors so that we don't leave until every beer is pouring perfect. And then you're assigned a consultant that now starts right up the beat with you to start addressing um, those lines and making sure that we maintain that consistency uh, going forward. Um, and I think that's a big thing because there, there are no other companies that do that or put that time and effort into really making sure that we are addressing that waste the minute that the product goes in. And moving on to the next slide is something that I, I really wanted to show you guys. Um, this is a case study and these are really used more on the sales side of things. Everyone tends to focus on the left side of the report where you're seeing your revenues and your profits and dropping those poor costs. And what you're looking at here is, um, is a brewery. They were doing over uh, 1,200 gallons uh, per month when they started with us, <clears throat> coming in at 81% efficient. That's what's circled there in, in the red. Um, for the, I don't know if it's hard to see here, but that's their sold efficiency. Of that 1,200 gallons, 81% of that had sales associated with it, um, and 19% of it had loss. And what you're seeing is the segmented waste categories here. Um, human being, unrung beverages, over pours, there's quality related issues, comps, system wastes, keg changes, and line cleanings. And what I want to point out here is that what you're seeing on the human side is a two part thing, right? Um, it could be people not ringing beverages up, but human is also issues that happen after the sensor uh, where the beer pours through clean, but it hits a long draw and we have an issue within the long draw that's causing problems that's foaming up after it's past the sensor. And we were able to identify, uh, I believe it was about the second week into working with this particular client, um, that they had a major glycol issue. Actually, uh, they needed a glycol recharge. There wasn't enough viscosity or enough glycol on the lines. And for those of you that they don't know what glycol is. It's it's a it's a it's a line of basically coolant. It keeps the the beer cold as it travels uh, through your draft lines. Beers like Goldilocks, right? It can't be too hot. It can't be too cold. It has to be just right. And glycol maintains that. If it gets too cold, over freezes, it's going to cause your beer to foam up. And if it gets too hot, um, it's going to do the same thing. And what happened with this particular client is we were able to identify pretty quickly that uh, they didn't have enough glycol in their lines. Not only that, their compressor wasn't working well, meaning glycol goes in a circular motion. It just keeps those lines cold. It goes through the lines. Once it hits where the tap is, it comes back, goes back through that glycol compressor, gets cold again and goes back out there. We were able to identify that. And if you look over on the ounces lost there, they were losing over 29,000 ounces per month, right? It's costing the business almost $11,000 in, um, in profit loss. Um, within 30 days of identifying this, going in and getting that fixed, if you look at the report down below, they went from 81% in efficiency to 94%. Um, percent. We were able to knock out 20,000 ounces. We were able to put that back into the business, right? This is product that's now being sold. It's not being wasted. Um, yes, the profit loss is a lot better. Um, but what we're doing is we're selling more product, which doesn't require us to go and pull more product in. We're getting more out of what we're doing. And um, this was this is something we do daily. On brewery side, it's a little bit of a bigger scale for the larger production facilities. But it all adds up over the course of the days. We have customers that have 200 taps. We have customers that have two taps, right? Um, and at the end of the day, waste occurring across the board. And um, and we get excited about being able to go in there and identify those problems and and work with each individual customers one on one to uh, to address that and uh, and help prevent that waste moving forward. And that's it for me. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ian. That was terrific. Uh, one thing that uh, craft beverage producers might be aware of, of course, is that all these pours affect your wastewater. And then you're paying to dispose of this beer in addition to losing the money of what you could have sold. So, you know, it impacts uh, the, the water quality of your wastewater dramatically. You may not be paying as many fees and that sort of thing, but, you know, you also get to recap the uh, you know, recoup that money that you're not paying for that disposal. So let's go to the question and answers. Um, we have a written question right now, but if you'd like to raise your hand, um, for those of you who don't,